Hello everyone, I am Nathan P. Butler, author of A Saga on Home Video, a fan's guide to U.S. Star Wars home video releases. Ooh, how nice, which you can find on Amazon right now. Great holiday gift. Plug, 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 shameless plug after shameless plug. Uh, this is my Star Wars vlog, the voice of reason or lack thereof. And you may notice here, not as good a lighting as usual, as I explained in the last vlog, which is about basically the prospects of a 4K release of The Last Jedi, and about the whole issue of the movie and TV assets of 20th Century Fox being acquired by Disney and all that. I'm trying to get out some initial quick reactions for those who follow the vlog, because I've been asked about several recent events, most notably The Last Jedi, and just needed a chance to get those thoughts out there, knowing that I'll be able to discuss them more in-depth in future podcasts like Star Wars Beyond the Films and Cloud City Casino, where I got a feeling me and Michael are going to disagree a bit based on his initial reactions to the film. Uh, so that should be entertaining. Uh, and I know that I can get into some conversations about The Last Jedi stuff while doing the live streams for Battlefront 2 and talking to people in the chat. But I want to get some initial reactions out there because people have been asking, and I didn't want to have to wait until, you know, the sun was out in order to do that. So I'm recording this on the evening of December 15th, 2017. This particular vlog is a spoiler-free reaction to The Last Jedi. The next episode of the vlog will be a spoiler-filled reaction to The Last Jedi. So those who are concerned about spoilers can listen to this one or watch this one just fine. Just understand that if you keep the playlist going and you watch the next episode, that will spoil. There will be uh, nothing held back in that one. Okay? So, my spoiler-free thoughts on The Last Jedi. Well, my wife and I went to go see it last night, right? The preview night or whatever they call it now, right? They used to call it a midnight showing, and it's not really a midnight showing anymore because now you go see the movie at like 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night on the night before it's supposed to release. Um, she worked until 7.30, so we didn't go to the first showing, but we went to the second available showing, which was 9.40 p.m., and we went to go see it at the Tinseltown uh, 17, I think they call it, the Cinemark 17 Theater in Fayetteville, Georgia, over there in the pavilion, if you happen to know the area. Which is actually kind of cool because they had some of those little giveaway things, and you got these if you attended. It's a little kind of uh, horizontal poster here, Star Wars The Last Jedi. See it in Cinemark XD. You got your characters there in the background for their different character posters. Um, XD, by the way is basically a step sort of between a standard screen and an IMAX screen. It's not as big as IMAX. It's bigger than a standard screen, so they call it XD. And this is a really cool theater. I mean, it's a place where basically it's like a lot of theaters are being revamped to, where they have a little bit less seating than they used to, but all the seats now automatically recline backwards and everything. you got the cup holders built in. Uh, you got a whole lot more leg room, so even if someone's reclined back, you can still pass in front of them to go use the restroom or whatever. Um, really cool kind of setup. And we went to go see it. Uh, we actually were all decked out, right? So my wife had on a, a Kylo Ren t-shirt and her Her Universe Darth Vader jacket. And then I had on my Star Wars Report shirt, right, for StarWarsReport.com, which is where Star Wars Beyond the Films and Cloud City Casino are both hosted at. Uh, and then I had my Darth Maul jacket on from Celebration 1, which is that, uh, almost looks like a Letterman jacket type thing with Maul's face on the back of it. Then I had him on my Rogue One hat from Disney Movie Rewards. It looks like a crew hat and everything. And uh, we hopped into Phasma. Uh, for those who don't know, after my wreck recently, uh, with that totaled my Kia Rio 5 door, we eventually were able to replace that and bought, or started payments on, let's be honest, a 2018 Kia Soul that is silver. And if you look at it from the back, it looks like a First Order Stormtrooper helmet, and being silver, we call it Phasma. And I think that the car itself is much cooler than the character has ever been. But that's just me as the owner, as the driver. Um, so we headed out in Phasma to go see the film. And the place was pretty packed, mostly with Star Wars fans who were talking, you know, kind of in-depth before the film. You could sort of hear the chatter and such. It was funny, though, because as we were going up to the ticket counter to basically show them the little uh, QR code, for the fact that we bought the tickets already uh, online so we can just get the tickets and go in. We hear these people who are buying tickets uh, at the next window, stand, like they're standing there talking to the person at the window because they, I guess, were the last ones in line or whatever, so they were able to talk to the attendant. Maybe they knew them, maybe they didn't, whatever. And they're like, man, like I don't get this, how like 
You remember the old film, like, Darth Vader turns out to be Luke Skywalker? I don't get how he fought himself, and, and, and he's dead serious. So, part of the time just going into the film was trying not to mock people, or to laugh at the sheer ridiculousness of it all. Though, I would assume these were people who probably only saw the films once or twice in the past, and are now getting into Star Wars sort of new, or again with the new films. Which is actually a good thing, so I don't really want to mock them. But there's another part of this, like, oh my god, you can't tell Luke from Anakin, you think he's his own father? Do you not understand? No, I am your father is referring to two people! Anyway. Um, so we had an interesting experience on the way in. Went and grabbed our concessions and headed into the theater. And uh, they didn't have any special glasses or anything this time. We did the real D 3D kind, but it wasn't like special uh, like Kylo Ren glasses like my wife got last time. It said it was just the regular glasses. And a uh, setback to take in the experience. So I guess the first thing I would say, again, spoiler free, is that my initial reaction after seeing it that I posted on Facebook for friends of mine pretty much still stands, which was, holy shit, I need some time to process this. Um, and I think I still am processing. Um, that was last night, and I went to a meeting for work today. And, of course, they all know that I'm a, a big Star Wars fan. So uh, my friend Chris, uh, who is the uh, another department chair for our virtual school, he's the department chair for a, a PE and uh, health and stuff like that, a CTAE and all that, for those who know what the heck that means in uh, educational parlance. And uh, he's asking me about it and such, and then... Our program specialist was asking about it. They were both actually going to be seeing it soon. And uh, I said kind of the same thing, that it was it was very different than any of the other Star Wars films. It was probably the biggest departure. And I thought Rogue One was a bit of a departure, but it feels thematically and in its way of filmmaking to be more of a departure than any of the other films from each other. And it introduces some things that had me going, huh, that's an interesting way to handle that. But at the same time, had some pretty strong, interesting twists um, that I would not have necessarily predicted. And, and and in some cases that was good, in some cases that was kind of a, hmm, I wonder if they just wasted an effort here. And had some really strong performances. I would say that um, just the presentation itself, the visual style was fantastic. Uh, music, of course, as always, fantastic. Great performances, great look. And as someone who really enjoys 3D movies and really hopes the 3D Blu-ray doesn't die before we at least get through Episode 9, uh, thankfully it looks like there are at least there are going to be 3D Blu-rays released in the UK that I guess can be used over here. Uh, at least if the Zavi thing is to be believed, see the last episode of the vlog for that. Uh, I found that the 3D was used very well. It was something where most of the time the 3D wasn't noticeable in the sense that you sat there thinking, oh, this is 3D. Hmm, look how they gimmicked that out. But it added to the overall experience, uh, especially when you're looking at things like um, a certain instance of Ray having sort of a vision and the depth that it provides to that, some of the space battles and the depth that it provides to that. It felt more like you were in a world because of the 3D rather than feeling like the 3D was gimmicked or the way that The Force Awakens did, which was feeling like you were looking into a diorama. Uh, Rogue One's 3D was pretty good, uh, but there were times where it did sort of feel like, yes, this is constructed specifically for 3D, like especially in some of the space battle scenes and such. But then you had The Force Awakens, where the 3D effect usually wasn't something coming towards you, like, say, the one shot, really, of the big finalizer. Uh, and usually, instead, it was the opposite, and it looked like the depth was going away from you, which is what I refer to as sort of looking into a diorama when looking at your TV screen. Um, this time, it felt very natural, and this is coming from someone who finds that most of his gaming right now, outside of Battlefront 2, uh, is in VR, which is very much about stereoscopic 3D uh, and that kind of immersive environment. I don't know if it's that that had trained my brain to accept that sort of thing more naturally, so it felt more natural in seeing it, or if it really just was a better use of the way that the filming fit with the 3D um, effects that were applied to it. So I'm assuming it wasn't filmed in 3D. I think it was a post-conversion, uh, like most movies are done these days. Uh, you can either film something in 3D that's very labor-intensive and makes it difficult to deal with things like effects shots after the fact on that effects-heavy movie, or you can just do a 2D movie, then do the effects and everything, 
then convert it to 3D, which is a lot more cost-effective most of the time, especially for something like Star Wars with lots of effects. So that was cool. Good presentation. Um, I didn't really hear much in the soundtrack that really jumped out at me. It just sort of felt like a refinement of what we got back with uh, The Force Awakens. I do have the soundtrack now. I'm listening to it in the car, which is so cool because the way the car is set up, I can have my phone in my pocket, my iPhone that has... Uh, the music downloaded on it, press a button on the, the uh, steering wheel and say, Play Star Wars The Last Jedi by John Williams. And it starts playing the album for me. Um, it's the little things that are fun, and I know that I'm, like, years behind on car technology and such. I'll probably get to the point where I have, like, a, a backup camera and stuff like that right around the time that cars drive themselves or fly. Um, but, you know, it just was one of these things where... Um, I was looking for something musically that felt as different as something like Kylo Ren's theme or Rey's theme from The Force Awakens and didn't really get that. But at the same time, there weren't any themes that jumped out at me as woefully out of place. Although the Canto Bright music, when we first go to Canto Bite, I say Bright, Canto Bite, um, that was a little bit off initially. It was kind of like what would happen if um, Star Wars met The Love Boat or Star Wars met Barry Manilow. Which actually worked well for the setting, but at first I was like, huh, interesting. But I've had that reaction to new music in things like Rogue One, in the Clone Wars films, so that's not particularly surprising to me. Um, as far as the depth of the characters, I think that one thing that this film did really well was that each character, each main character, did feel like they had an arc. Each one of them sort of went through a change, even though the film itself probably only lasts a matter of days in the long run. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. I also thought it was interesting that we had a film here that picks up exactly where the last one left off. In fact, I think there may even be some overlap, a tiny bit of overlap. And in doing so, it kind of means that we've got basically two films here that take place probably in the span of less than two weeks, maybe even less than a week. And that's a little bit different for Star Wars, because we're used to the idea of big time jumps. In the original trilogy, we basically had a three-year time jump, then a one-year time jump, though it's not exactly that because of the whole time within months of the year, at least in Legends, but that's a whole other thing, and involves discussion of the Essential Atlas that we don't really have time for here. Um, and then when it came to the prequels, right, we had a ten-year time jump and then a three-year time jump. We even had time jumps in the midst of what was happening in the Clone Wars. We've had some minor time jumps happening in Rebels. The only time we really didn't see a time jump was between the end of Rogue One and beginning of A New Hope. And that really wasn't the same kind of thing because one was made in 77, the other was made uh, and released in 2016. It was just that they were made in reverse order, so one could lead into the other. So now it feels like they run one into the other. But it certainly didn't at the time that we were first seeing it, because we were seeing it so long after the first one. Whereas in this case, brand new film picks up where, two years ago, brand new film had left off. And it's just a little bit odd. You're looking for character development in ways that are different than the character development that we saw back in the other films. Because they haven't had years to react to what just happened. It's all very raw, it's all very fresh. Um, and as such... Their starting point is very well known, but they damn well better get somewhere by the time that's, that they get to the end of that film to complete whatever character arc perhaps they began in the last one or that exists as a result of the last one. And thankfully, they managed pretty much to do that. Um, there were cutesy things. There were some odd things. I think the humor was done fairly well. It was a film that had funny moments in it that were mostly um, well done, well in context, and very much like original trilogy humor, as opposed to slapsticky, kind of childish humor like we got back in the prequels. Although, there were moments that did have me going, oh, really? Why that? Why did you include that? Uh, I will say that probably the key moment that fits that type of description to me, I won't spoil it, but suffice to say, if you've seen the film, I'm talking milk. Um, there's just some weird choices made in some cases. But I've always said that uh, one of the things that got me to really get into The Force Awakens is that I like Kylo Ren as a complex psychological character. Rey wasn't quite as complex, but the psychology of Kylo Ren really kind of struck me. And I like those types of characters. And we get to see that played out in spades in this film, 
which draws me into it and really gives us some satisfactory developments for him as a character and all the ones around him. Um, I will say this is one of the few times that I think I've seen a Star Wars film that has really surprised me. Um, a lot of times it has been... We know what's going to happen because it was the prequels. We know generally kind of where things are going to end up. It's just a question of how, whereas these are heading towards an unknown future, so that gives us a chance to sort of see something new. But we didn't really see that with The Force Awakens. Now, argue whether or not The Force Awakens is a carbon copy of A New Hope or just used elements of A New Hope, as J.J. Abrams talks about, about trying to quickly draw people back into what is familiar to get them into this new era and introduce new characters and whatever. Um, either way, it didn't really feel like usually in The Force Awakens there was much of an unknown. Same thing really with Rogue One. There wasn't a lot of an unknown to what was going to happen with Rogue One. Whereas in this film, there were twists and turns I did not see coming at all. Not sure they were all the best decisions in some cases, um, but I was genuinely surprised at moments within this film, and that is not something that usually happens with Star Wars for me. Um, so, thumbs up for that. And just generally, like I said, it's, it's taking some time to digest. It's one of those films that, I mean, it's an absolute freaking game changer when it comes to Star Wars. It changes your perceptions on certain aspects of things like the Force, um, to some degree on good and evil, or at least blurring the lines uh, between light and dark, or blurring the lines between who's doing right and who's doing wrong. Um, it certainly acts as the second act of a trilogy in that it helps set up the final act that is to come while building on the first act exactly as you would hope it would. And uh, it gives us some new characters that in some cases are interesting, some uh, underused, and uh, just sets up, again, more things to play out later. I'd love to see a particular new Resistance character show up in the next installment. Uh, it's just kind of one of those things where you're waiting to see what happens next, and I think that's actually where this film leaves me questioning the most, which is, where on earth do they go from here? You kind of get a sense of what they're building towards for Episode Nine, but Nine is going to be J.J. Abrams again. And he has a very different eye and different style than Ryan Johnson. Granted, I really enjoyed The Force Awakens. I really enjoyed Abrams' take on the Star Trek reboots. But it's a different eye. And with a game-changer of a film such as this... I would hate for us to see Episode Nine turn out to be something that doesn't pay off the changes made here. So excited for where it's going, but a little bit uh, trepidatious at the same time. Now, of course, people always try to say, hey, you need to come up with an order of preference for the films. Favorite to least favorite, everybody's got to do it. And I think that's kind of crap. Um, but I've said plenty of times that for me, it's more like there are tiers. So there's sort of a top tier, second tier, third tier, fourth tier when it comes to the previous films. And in each tier, there are two films. And a lot of times they jockey back and forth on which one is the preference of the two, but it's always those two before the next group of two, before the next group of two, before the next group of two. So my top tier going into this film would have been Rogue One and The Force Awakens jockeying back and forth for top tier, then Revenge of the Sith and Return of the Jedi for the next tier, then uh, A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back for the next tier, again, because I'm big on pacing and that's where I had some issues, and then you get down to the bottom tier, and that's Attack of the Clones and uh, The Phantom Menace. I'm not quite sure where The Last Jedi fits in there. It's one of those films that either needs to be, like, up at the top, or it needs to be kind of mid-level because of how it approached things. Because in a lot of ways, this is almost like two films happening in parallel um, that only intertwine at certain points, uh, which makes it a little bit hard to digest. I'm thinking it's probably going to wind up up there in that top tier alongside The Force Awakens at Rogue One, which means that the new, you know, rebooted saga and its films um, have managed to knock another one out of the park or pretty close to it. But I haven't digested enough to actually be able to say that. And I'm somebody who looks at his own opinion when it comes to rankings of films and favorite films as kind of suspect. Because remember, for a long time, the reason why I thought Revenge of the Sith was my absolute favorite and why I considered it my favorite was not so much because of the film, but as the experience of the film, having read Matthew Stover's novelization, it gave it much more depth than appeared on screen, what I call the Stover effect. We coined that term on Beyond the Films ages ago. Um, I would also say that looking back on it, I remember my first day of podcasting ever. My first day of podcasting ever was the same day that Attack of the Clones was released. And what did I say in the first episode of Chrono Radio, my first podcast? Attack of the Clones is the best Star Wars movie ever. 
Now it's one of my bottom two. And then, of course, Revenge of the Sith came out. It became a favorite, thanks to the Stover novel, and stayed that way for a while. Then came The Force Awakens, and it became the favorite. Then came Rogue One, and it became the favorite. So I gotta wonder if, to some degree, psychologically for me, I am very much like the politician who is willing to be convinced by the last person he talked to and doesn't have any strong positions, and instead am someone who is willing to be swayed by the newest, shiniest Star Wars movie out there, and that it takes me sometimes years to put that into perspective and look at things in a way that really sort of puts the merits of one film against another. I think I still evaluate films on an intellectually honest sort of level, but am I able to actually compare one to another in a way that is fair? And in doing so, am I able to get a fair ranking, so to speak? And I'm not sure that I can do that with this film yet, uh, or maybe even all the most recent films. Maybe it's going to take me a while to really kind of get a, a chance to pull off the rose-colored glasses and look with just regular specs. So good stuff. I look forward to talking about it with uh, Mark Herleman, who seems to have been very positive on it on Star Wars Beyond the Films. And I look forward to talking to Michael Morris about uh, Cloud City Casino, because he... not so much uh, when it came to this film. So those will be fun. Hopefully you'll check those out. Uh, they'll be in upcoming episodes on StarWarsReport.com for those two podcasts, but I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly when that's going to happen. I would assume they'll be very soon, but can't say exactly when at this point. And, of course, for spoiler-filled thoughts on The Last Jedi for me, check out the next blog being released shortly after this one. Uh, for now, though, I would say go see it. It is a game-changer. It is interesting. There are defined character arcs, and it's going to be one of those Star Wars films that is definitely remembered as something different. Um, some will love it. Some will hate it. I doubt there'll be very many in the middle. Um, but that said, that always makes for an interesting experience. As always, thank you for watching. Make sure you check out the spoiler-filled one next, if that's your thing. May the Force be with you.